Now on to history. Today's programme, which is about the Middle Ages, looks at life in the town. I'm shopping. There's nothing very remarkable about that. If you live in a town, like most people, it's something you might do nearly every day. Even if you live in the country, you can probably get into a town once or twice a week. But in the Middle Ages, very few people lived in towns. And there weren't many shops either. Today, we're going to see what life was like in the Middle Ages in a town. But first, let's find out why towns developed. Take this town, Lincoln. It's on a high hill, looking out across an open plain. A settlement on a hill was easy to defend against enemies. There's a river running past the bottom of the hill to the sea. Until quite recently, it was often easier to travel or get supplies by river than by road. So it's not surprising that as long ago as the Iron Age, about 200 years BC, a local British tribe settled here. They defended themselves with swords and shields, and archaeologists have found some in the river. When the Romans invaded Britain in 43 AD, they began to build roads. This was to make it easier for their armies to march out and defeat the Britons. Two of the great Roman roads to the north, the Foss Way and Ermine Street, met near the river crossing. But to make travel even easier, the Romans connected the river, the Witham, by canal to the River Trent. They built a fort on top of the hill so their troops could control the road and the river. The fort became a town, Lindum Colonia. It was surrounded by strong stone walls and entered by four main gates. Later, it was extended south, as far as the river. You can still see Roman remains in Lincoln. Newport is the only Roman arch in the country still spanning a main road, Ermine Street. In Roman times, wheel traffic passed through the main arch, just as it does today, while pedestrians, like me, came into town through this narrower entry. When the Romans left, new invaders came, and they too saw the advantages of living in the shelter of the walls. We know this because we found a lot of coins here, and the names on them are a mixture. Ethelred is an Anglo-Saxon name. Knut is a Danish name. In fact, Lincoln became one of the five most important Danish boroughs, or towns. Now, on this coin is a picture of the most famous invader of all, William the Conqueror. William came to Lincoln in 1068, just after the conquest. He took in the importance of the size and position of the town and immediately set about making it a secure Norman base by building this castle and strengthening the ancient Roman walls. Soon afterwards, William ordered the building of a cathedral and Lincoln became the centre of a vast bishopric stretching from the Thames in the south to the Humber in the north. The cathedral is a marvellous building, but it's not the one begun under William the Conqueror. That was destroyed by an earthquake 50 years after it was built. The cathedral we see today was begun by a bishop called Hugh, a monk from France. He organised the rebuilding, helped the masons to carry the stones, and spent a lot of his own money on it too. But even a bishop couldn't pay for a cathedral all by himself. Hugh persuaded the townsmen to help. In a place of honour, at the front of the building, there's a statue of a swineherd. He gave his whole life savings towards building the cathedral. And on the other side is a statue of Hugh himself. He was considered so holy that he was made a saint after he died. Pilgrims flocked to the shrine of St Hugh. They needed places to stay and things to eat and drink, more than a few local traders could provide. And the churchmen were good customers too, and so were the nobles, who lived or were staying in the castle. So tradesmen crowded in from the surrounding countryside and from abroad, selling their goods and their skills. 
they knew that in the town they were safe under the protection of the church, and more practically, the castle garrison. Today, people still come into town to do their shopping. It may be in the high street or in the market. There was far less choice in medieval shops or stalls than there is nowadays. In the Middle Ages, the market was the centre of town life. People from the country areas sold things that weren't produced in the town, like fresh fruit and vegetables. Milk or cheese and fish from the North Sea. You can still buy fish from this stall on a boat moored on the River Witham. In those days, fish and meat came to the town by barge and were sold near the high bridge over there. Markets made money for a town through the rents they had to pay to the town council. So a town had to ask the king's permission to hold a market and they had to pay, often heavily, for the privilege. Now, in the Middle Ages, there was no fixed time or place for holding a parliament. They were called when and where the king decided and he was as likely to hold it in a cathedral as in a palace or a castle. In 1327, when King Edward III decided to hold his first parliament, here, in the chapter house of Lincoln Cathedral, the townsmen seized the opportunity to ask the king for the right to hold a market three days a week, and a great annual fair as well. What did they sell in the markets and fairs? Lincoln was chiefly famous for its woolen cloth, sarlet cloth, that only bishops, nobles, judges, and foreigners were allowed to wear. Wool to make cloth was shipped from the rich sheep-rearing areas north of Lincoln, down the Trent, through the canal, and along the river with them to the town. Here the wool was woven and cloth to be exported was shipped on down to the coast. But in 1369, Lincoln lost the right to sell cloth to foreigners, and the cloth makers refused to make the scarlet cloth any more. They turned instead to Lincoln green, the colour Robin Hood and his men were supposed to have worn. What else was made? Well, Lincoln was well known for its fine boots and shoes. And it also did a flourishing trade in pots. These seem to have been mass-produced using child labour. We can still see the finger marks on the base, and they're too small to have been made by an adult. The town was also well known for the skill of its stonemasons, who quarried the local limestone and used it for building. High up in the roof of Lincoln Cathedral, a master carpenter and his assistant are repairing some of the ancient beams. Many of the original timbers came from the old Sherwood Forest, where Robin Hood lived. The methods the carpenters are using haven't changed much since 1420, when the cathedral got a new tower. What was life like for a carpenter and his family in 1420? Oh, 
God's bones, child, what are you doing? Oh. Please, ma'am. Fleas. Fleas? They're for the fleas. They seize the light and they jumps on the bread and the bread's all sticky with glue, see? There's one now, wiggling. Look. Mary, what's this house made of? Wood. So, carry on like that and we'll all wake up one morning burnt to death, won't we? But I thought... Oh, don't think, Mary, please. Now it's past five o'clock. Have you swept up? This straw needs changing, too. Why? There now, that's my husband. You cut some bread, I'll pour the ale. If it's a fine day, you can hang the clothes outside to air. Morning. Oh, Godspeed, sir. Morning. Those churchmen work you too hard. Think you could build a tower in a day. I take a pride in my work, that's all. Can't work too late, can I? The guild would find me as soon as look at me if I was to work extra hours. I hope it's not another cockroach in that bread. Chalk. I've mixed chalk with the flour again. That's against the law. Where's the baker's mark? Never buy bread without a mark. They must see you coming a mile off at that market. Well, at least the ale's not been watered down. The young apprentice, he's coming this evening. He'll need a sleeping pallet in the workshop. We'll need extra food then. Now, let's see, it's Friday, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Right, fish. Yes, we'll have green porre. Now, listen carefully. We'll need a jug of milk, and if it's had water put in it, you're not to take it. And some greens, onions, almonds, and an extra loaf. With a baker's mark. And? And I'll hold it first to be sure it's not underweight. Good. Now then, the fish. Smell it. Before you buy it, get it right up under your nose and pay no more than a penny for it, mind. Oh, and this time, don't get it from that John de Paris. His fish was so rotten last week, he got what he deserves. Put in the pillory and burnt the fish under his nose. <laughs> The tipplers, ma'am. Here, halfpence worth. Here, haven't been plucking your eyebrows, have you? No. Remember now, when you go to market, you keep your eyes on the ground and don't smile at the men. Oh, and don't wiggle your backside like that. You look like a trout. And remember the palette for the apprentice this evening. <sighs> so it's a good trade. And Joseph was a carpenter. Now, you understand your father's paid his shilling and you're bound to your apprenticeship. This is your indenture, your contract. It's written in English. Your father will keep your half for you. Come here. It's Greece, I think. For my part, I promise to uh, teach you my craft, to feed you and to clothe you. Fetch me a feather and then go mix some ash and water. And he'll be well fed. Won't he, wife? Depends who goes to market. Don't worry, even if she does poison you with her cooking and you can't work, the guild will take care of you. Now, you may not uh, read, but you can speak, can't you, boy? Hmm. What do you make of those? Or you can use wine. Well? You could cover the cracks over and no one would see. No, 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 no! Your first lesson. In the Guild, we aim for quality of work and honesty of character. Wood like this, we throw it away. Only the finest oak is used for roof beams. Two carpenters built a house badly. What happened? It fell down. <laughs> then what happened? Well, they had to rebuild it at their own expense. Do you understand? Well, I hope so, because tomorrow you and I are working on the cathedral tower, and we can't afford to rebuild there, now can we? No. No, it's a great responsibility, this job. To the Guild and to God. Remember that. It's long past curfew. Bed. Five of the clock we start. I want the workshop swept and all the tools cleared. You get bread and ale before you set out. 
Yes. And you'll be taught some manners as well, won't you, Mary? Yes, sir. At meal times, you're not to cram your mouth full like a monkey or throw your bones on the floor. And you're not to pick your teeth with your knife or blow your nose on the tablecloth. And no football. Too many people have got themselves killed playing that game. Mary, give the lad a new candle to light him to the workshop. I'm for bed. Oh, dear. Right. Fire's up. Now, remember what I said. Work hard, and you could do well for yourself in Lincoln. Good night. Good night. Good night. There's a pageant soon. All the rich people dress up. We could go and watch it together. In a year and a day, I could be a freeman of the city. But women can't do that, can they? And then there's the miracle plays. We could go and watch them, too. The master does the repairs for them. And there's bull baiting. In seven years, I'll be a full member of the Guild of Carpenters. Women can't join, can they? No. And there's dancing bears near the market. St. Joseph was a carpenter, you know. I know. The carpenter and his family lived in a house rather like that. Even if it was smaller, it would still have had two stories. Building land in Lincoln and other towns was very expensive. And even rich people couldn't afford to build sideways. So they began to build up and out, getting more space from overhanging jetties. If you stood about under one of these, it could be disastrous. as you can see. Well, anyway, Parliament had passed an act ordering all townspeople to remove from the streets all manner of filth and dirt, swine and branches, and to keep the streets clean for the future. But the town councils couldn't get the people to obey this law, and it was chiefly the swine and cats and dogs and rats that ran about the street that carried away much of the rubbish. People who carried on the same kind of business were encouraged to live in the same street, partly so that the guild could check up on the quality of the tradesmen's goods and also see that one was being overcharged, which must have been nice for the customers. This street is called Saltergate. A salter was a salt merchant. At the end of Saltergate is Lincoln's original council hall. It's built over the old Roman road and on the site of one of the Roman gates. The arms of the city are carved above the arch. The council still meets here today, but it's not responsible for the same kind of things. In the Middle Ages, the council had to make sure that every citizen was armed in case the town was attacked. And it also dealt with cases of violence and murder. It had to organize firefighting. Fire was always a danger, with so many wooden houses crowded together. And when a parliament was held, the councillors chose who should go to it. When the council had anything important to discuss with the whole town, they summoned everyone together by sounding this great bell on the roof. All these things cost money and the council raised taxes from the Burgesses, people who owned houses in the town. The money was kept in a chest, something like this, and only the most trusted members of the council had keys to it. But they were used to handling money because the mayor and his council were only chosen from the richest citizens. I wonder if the carpenter's apprentice worked hard enough to become a master craftsman. If he did, then perhaps he even became mayor.
Our final daytime on two programme is...